Okay. So you're welcome to this today's class, Data Analytics Masterclass with David. All right, so what are we going to be covering in today's session? What are we going to be covering? We're going to be looking at the basics of data analytics. We're also going to be looking at um, skills development, the required skills you need to develop in the field of data anal anal analytics. We're also going to be looking at the careers in data, all the several careers in data. And we're also going to look at scripts, DM, who we'll know the meaning when we we'll get there. And then we'll also look at types of data analysis. And we'll also um, have a demo, a little demonstration using cargo data set of what a data analysis process is like. Okay. A little brief about me. My name is David F. Young. I currently work um, with a startup as a data analyst at the moment. I um, switched from a banking career to a data career, like tech career, data analyst, right? So I did not start out uh, from a tech foundation. Yeah, even though I was, I was a science student back in school, but then really that doesn't really matter. Uh, so the point is, whichever background you are coming in from, it doesn't really matter. If you have had experience in any other place, in any other industry, it doesn't really matter so much. It doesn't really count so much, right? The important thing is that you have the desire, the interest, and sufficient enthusiasm to go through the whole learning process. Okay. Okay, so we can't talk about the field of data analytics without talking about what data is all about, right? We, if we're analyzing data, then we need to know what data is, like the foundation, really what is data, right? So um, data is very simple in the simplest format, records of information. Like um, if you, you well, we, all have, we all have bank accounts, right? When they take your name to open an account for you in the bank, it's an information. That record has become data. When you deposit money into the bank, something happens, an event happens. Once that event is recorded, it becomes data, right? And this data could be facts, could be dimensions. So what do I mean by facts and dimensions? Say for example, let's, let's use the bank account example again. So if you open the account or when you open the account in the bank, they have your data. The amount of money you have in your account is a fact, right? Like the facts data. Um, your gender is a dimension data. So the amount of money does not, does not have anything to do with that if you're male or female, but that dimension of it is like a form of data. So data could be facts, which is mostly numeric, like amount of money in your account, like I said earlier on, or dimensions could be your country, could be your gender, your color, all those um, things that we can't really quantify. So really data is like a record of information. Today in our social media age, your likes, your tweets, your retweets, your Instagram follows, your YouTube likes, your little YouTube subscriptions, they are all data, right? Because it's, you, you, you took an action, you, there was an event, and then that event is being recorded. That's where data comes from. So any event that you record, it becomes data. So you say, for example, you go out to buy food for yourself, and then you come back and record it that, oh, I spent, 1,000 naira to buy food. The fact that you have recorded it makes it data, right? So that's really what data is all about. It's record of information everywhere. And so today in, in, our, in our society today, there's so much data with the inflow of technology, social media, data comes from several sources, several, several sources, uncountable sources. That's why we're hearing things like big data because when, when we talk about big data, I talk about the volume, the size, the, the, the veracity is, is different. It is different, different formats. You can have data in, in structured data. You can have unstructured data. It's different formats, right? So data is too much. So that's why the, there's a need for data analysis today in our society. Okay. Next slide says, what are the types of data we have? There are basically two types of data. Data could be quantitative or qualitative. Could be quantitative and or Qualitative. So quantitative is simply a good example I have here is how many children do you have? In other words, it can be quantified. I have five children. I have 10 children. How much do you have in your account? I have $10,000 in my account. So these are things that you can quantify. 
and then there is also qualitative. So you can't really quantify them, but then they have that you can you can qualify them. Which country are you from? I'm a Nigerian. Where do you stay? I stay in Lagos. I can say I stay in several Lagos, is or Lagos, one Lagos, two. There's just one Lagos, right? So we can actually qualify that I stay in a state called Lagos. So that could be quantitative or qualitative. So if we look at the chat on your screen, it says it now breaks it down. So because uh, in qualitative data and quantitative data, there are also types within it. So we'll start from quantitative. Let's start with quantitative. So really, the idea of quantitative brings to your mind numerical data, right? Numbers, numbers, because you can quantify it. You can't quantify oil, but you can quantify spoons. So, right. So oil will fall under qualitative, and then um, spoons will fall under quantitative because they are numerical data. And then numerical data could either be discrete or continuous. It could either be discrete or continuous. What discrete data? Discrete data is a data that only have a particular number. Only have particular numbers. Say for example, I have one child. I have two children. I have five children. I cannot have 1.2 children, right? Now compared to continuous data, Continuous data can be any numerical value, any numerical value. In my account, I can have ten thousand three hundred. I can have ten thousand uh, dollars fifty cents, right? I can have five thousand three hundred and twenty-two naira seventy-five kobo, right? So those are continuous data. It can be one point two. It can be zero point zero 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 five. So it says numeric and it can be, it can fall in any value of the distribution table, right? And then we say discrete is a form of a form of data that can only take a particular set of numbers. You cannot have 1.2 children. You cannot have 1.2 spoons. You either have one spoon or two spoons, right? So that's the idea between discrete and continuous data. So it's important to understand these things because once you start analyzing data going forward, you realize that uh, the methodology you would use to, to analyze the continuous data is different from the method used to analyze the discrete data. Say, for example, uh, we have sales of uh, sales of products in our, in our company. Sales of products can be any number. It can be the product, the money you get from sales can be anything. We can make 100 naira from sales. We can make 100 naira 50 kobo from sales. We can make 105 naira 22 kobo from sales, right? And so, there are lots of analysis you can do on that kind of data. Say, for example, you can do a regression analysis on continuous data, but you can't do a regression analysis on discrete data because your discrete data is just a discrete number. It just has to be a particular set of numbers. And then we'll move to qualitative data, also called categorical data. So it's fundamental you understand the types of data, how they are. Uh, how they are being identified and what they mean. Because like I said, uh, once you start meeting data, the first thing you have to consider before you think of a means to analyze the data is what kind of data is this? Is it a categorical data? Okay, then I can visualize it in a certain, in a certain way. Say for example, I have um, a continuous data, like sales, I, I mentioned sales. I can draw, I, I, I can plot a line chart on sales. But I can plot a line chart on categorical data. Because category, categorical data is, we have, to, we have to, two, two, two types here. We have nominal and ordinal. Nominal means named categories. Could be red, blue, black. So if I have a data that has a table of colors, I can plot a line chart with those colors. Why? Because it's a categorical data and it's nominal. It's just named categories. It's black, white, green. Is like Nigeria, Congo, Germany. You just named categories, so they're 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 not they're not related in any way particular. So I would rather use a bar chart to visualize a named category than use a bar chart to visualize a continuous a continuous uh a, a continuous quantitative data, right? So really that's how it works. So it's important to understand these things. And then ordinal data um categories with an implied order. So they're not numbers, but then they have an implied order. They have an implied order. A good example is, uh, let's say, um, 
max, maximum, minimum, or small, smallest, medium. So let's say you are selling on an e-commerce shop or you're managing data of an e-commerce shop, and then they have um, certain kinds of goods. Let's say they have a shirt, right? So the data for that particular kind of shirts, they have um, for small, they have medium, they have large, they have extra large, and all that. So that is a categorical data, but then it implies an order. It has a certain kind of order. So that's why it's called ordinal data. So while are we going through this point, it is important that for you to know how to handle data, you need to know what data is, know the fundamental types of data there is, and then you now know what kind of method to approach in solving problems with data. So uh, I hope we are together so far, right? Yes, yes. So the next slide says, what is data analytics? So we've understood what data is, we've understood uh, the types of data. So now the next question is, what is data analytics? What is data analysis all about, really? What is the idea behind data analytics? And so in a very simple way, I'll just say that data analytics is the transformation of raw data into insights. It's the transformation of raw data into insights. Raw data into insights, that's really what it is. The process where you get your raw data, you transform the raw data, every other thing you do in between to get insights out of it is really what data analytics is all about. It is important because, <clears throat> excuse me, it is important because in today's um, world, data is everywhere. And businesses want to be able to make data-driven decisions. Businesses want to be able to make decisions not based on their guts, not based on what they think, not based on the what's trending, but based on data, what data is saying. And really that's what data analytics is all about. So it's like <clears throat> it's like crude. Crude unrefined almost has no value. But then the value of crude comes in when you now refine it, right? So data analysis is that process where you refine crude to get things out of it, to get petrol, to get diesel, to get kerosene to get gas that we use. So that whole process where we get insights out of it is really what data analytics is all uh, about. All right. So we'll look at three case studies on the effects of data in our society today. Three case studies, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's start with the good. So case one says the good. It says, oh, so you are a sports analyst that have never played professionally. <laughs> well, please tell me all you know about pro athletes. So this man is, in, is, is saying that somebody says he's a sports analyst. He has never played professionally before, but yet he knows more about the players than the players themselves. Now, that's a good thing about data today. Most of us, we watch football, we see Messi taking his seven ballon d'or, we see Ronaldo playing very well, some teams are doing good, others are doing bad. And often you think that the, these guys are just on the drawing board, just do one or two things on the drawing board and that's all. But I'm here to tell you that it's not so. That sports, just an example, sports has gone deep into analytics, right? Really, really deep. Like they pick data to the smallest point as at what point was the pass made? What second was the pass made? What position on the feet? How many meters from the goalpost was, did he take the shot? How many defenders were around him by the time he passed the ball? They have all these data as little as this, and then they use it to understand their opponents, make decisions against the opponent based on the data of the opponent. They have data of all the players. Okay, if you play, if you play, um, what's the name of this thing? PS, PlayStation. Uh, for when you're selecting the team you used, or the players, you will notice some um, data about that player, like his, his um, energy level. I don't play PS so much. Or I know you play PS, you get, you get the point. His energy level or how many minutes he can run, all those kinds, of, you see information about it. So these guys, they, they have this information and these are some of the good things we see with data today. There are several other good examples of data use. Say for example, on YouTube, you subscribe to a video, YouTube automatically gives you several other videos that are related to that kind of video. That's the power of data. 
So the benefits of data uh, uh, data analysis are undeniable in our society today, right? So let's go to the bad. I'm sure most of us can remember the Facebook data scandal with Cambridge Analytica, uh, maybe last year or last year, yeah, where Facebook gave out, or it was said that Facebook gave out our data. <laughs> so this meme says Facebook now hiring. We already have, okay, Facebook now hiring. And um, Mark Zuckerberg says, no need to apply. We already have all your details. Well, funny, but true. Organizations, banks, not just Facebook, they have your data. They have all your details, everything. They even know you more than you know yourself. I watched a movie, um, what was the name of the movie? Beta Test, right? In the movie, uh, someone collected people's data and then from their data, he created a product that would appeal to their desires. Because let's say your online data, for example, your online data tells us what you like, tells us the kind of videos you like watching, tells us the kind of music you like to listen to, tells us literally everything about you, about your desires, your preferences. And so in that movie, they're able to create a product that fits each person's desires, preferences, and all that, and they bought the products. And oftentimes we think that we are buying things um, based on logic. Well, actually, you may be buying things based on manipulation by the market data, right? Okay, and then we have the last case study, which is the ugly. So I have two charts here. The first chart says misleading, and the second chart says more accurate. If you look at the first chart, it says, if Bush tax cuts expire, top tax rates now is 35%. By January 2013, it's going to be 39.6%. Wow, it's a very large difference. But if you look at the second, more accurate chart, it says, if Bush tax cuts expire, top tax rates now is 35%. January 2013 is 39.6%. The same percentage, but difference doesn't look so much. When you now carefully observe, you realize that this one that is misleading, the y axis started at 34%. And this one that is more accurate started at zero. Data can be misleading, especially when people want to use it to, to tell their own story. It's almost like the Bible. You know, they say that the Bible can cover for anything. You can kiss somebody and see Bible support. You can, because like, you can take it out of context. So data taken out of context can be misinterpreted, can be used to tell a wrong information. And oftentimes politicians do this. There's a lot of things that happen, like we see it in politics, and then you start saying that, oh, this politician has actually done so and so things. But actually it's just very, very, very small compared to the actual thing. But then he magnified data to tell a particular story. A good example is COVID. A good example is COVID. If you check the whole media frenzy around COVID in Nigeria, someone would think that, um, that COVID in Nigeria is something that people are dying of COVID here and there in Nigeria. But you would now realize that, um, you would now realize that they said, or not just, they didn't say statistics, say that. In a year, snake bites kill 2,000 people in, in Nigeria. People, over 2,000 people die from snake bites in Nigeria in a year. Now, since these last two years that COVID has been in Nigeria, we don't have up to 4,000 deaths in Nigeria, meaning that snake bites have killed more people than COVID has killed more people. But then the whole hype around COVID, 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 COVID is making it look like, ah, many people have COVID, but it's not really true when you now compare the real data, right? So that kind of thing. Okay. So yeah, we have four types of data analytics. We've looked at what data is, we've looked at the uh, types of data, we've looked at the several key studies of data, how data can be used for good causes, uh, analyzed for bad causes as well, and also analyzed for ugly cases and situations. So right now we're going to be looking at the four types of data analytics, all right? The first one we have is descriptive data analytics. Descriptive data analytics. Descriptive data analytics tries to answer the question, what happened? Now, something I did not say is that the field of data analysis 
data science, all the data, anything you can think about, primarily is out there to answer questions, to provide answers to questions, to provide answers to questions. That's the game. Questions to provide answers to questions. That is it. That's all we do. There is a question. We use data to get answers to the question. So there are several, there are four basic types of ways you can get answers to questions or what kind of questions you can answer. So descriptive analysis tries to answer the question of what happened. A good example is you're selling your shop or your business and um, revenue is going up, revenue is coming down. You don't know. Descriptive analysis will tell you that, oh, revenue is increasing. Revenue is decreasing. Our customers are increasing. Our customers are decreasing. That kind of a thing, right? It goes to describe, it's telling what is happening in the business, right? That's descriptive analytics. And then the next one we have is called diagnostic analytics. Diagnostics, diagnostic analysis tries to answer the question of why did this happen? So descriptive tells us that revenue has increased. Diagnosis tells us why did revenue increase? Oh, our customers have reduced. It says try to answer the question of why did it happen, right? Why did revenue increase? Why did revenue decrease? All right, those kind of things. That's really what it's all about. And then the next one we have is predictive analytics. Predictive analysis goes to answer the question what is likely to happen in the future? Okay, revenue has increased. Why did revenue increase? Revenue increased because product A sold better than product B. And most of our customers bought product A in a certain location. Okay, based on this information, what is going to happen in the next three months? Would customers still buy product A? Or would they change from buying product A to buy product B? What is likely going to happen? That is what predictive analysis gets to answer. You try to predict now. So for these forms of data analytics, they have their several tools, methods used for analysis, right? Say for example, regression. Regression tells me on in predictive analysis, I can use regression analysis in, in predict, in, to predict future sales, right? I can use forecast method to predict future sales, but I'm not gonna use regression to find out what's going on. Right, a simple exploration analysis would help me find out what's going on. Why did it happen? I'm not going to use regression. I could use other method, maybe a chi-square analysis to find out why it's going on, or a correlation analysis to find out what's going on, or why it happened, why what happened happened. That sort of a thing. And then we have prescriptive analysis or prescriptive analytics. Prescriptive analysis tries to give a recommendation by saying that, okay, what is the best course of action? What is the best course of action? So we have seen what happened that, okay, our sales dropped drastically. Why did sales drop dr drastically? Because um, product A reduced sales compared to product B. And then you now realize that product B was not actually selling all the wire, but because, because sales in product A reduced, it now became obvious that product B was not, was not selling before. You're not trying to predict, okay, what's going to happen in the next three months? Will that be the same customer trends? Will customer trends change in the next three months? If customer trends do not change, okay, what do we do? Should we improve product A? Okay, should we bring more salespeople to sell product A better? Should we close down product B? Those are the kind of things that eventually comes up from prescriptive analysis because you try to answer what is the best course of action from your analysis okay so the next uh, model we are going to look in now is um skills development skills development so what are the required skills how do we go into it when it comes to data and analytics what are the essential skills for data science and data analytics they are basically four essential skills they can all be summarized into four essential skills right Everything, the tools, the, the methods you learn, they can all be summarized into four essential skills. And we'll run through the four of them. The first one is data cleaning and preparation. Data cleaning and preparation. 
um, it is said, it's not said, statistics, the, the, the data says so, that about 60% of your data analysis process is going to be data cleaning and preparation. Yeah. And data cleaning is not very interesting. It's not very nice. You know, it could be tiring. It's not very interesting. <laughs> but then that's where bulk of the analysis process goes into. The reason is because just like they say in computer science, that garbage in, garbage out. The quality of your data determines the quality of your analysis. If your data is not clean, if your data is not well prepared, then you're going to be having noise in your data. You're going to be having so much noise from your data. You, you won't be able to find patterns. You won't be able to understand, to, to see patterns or not pattern in data because of the noise. And so a large chunk of time has to be invested in cleaning your data and preparing data to be in suitable format for analysis, right? That is critical and important. So it's very, very important. And so there are several skills. There are several tools used in that process, right? Several tools in that process, but then it's a process that is required in your data cleaning and preparation step of analysis. And then the next essential skill we have is data visualization and reporting. Because after you've cleaned your data and analyzed your data, you need to be able to visualize your data and report your data, right? You need to be able to visualize data and report your data. Because they say as human beings, we, we learn more through visuals, right? We learn more through visuals. When you are seeing things, you're able to interpret it easy, easier rather. So uh, if they write DOG for you and show you an image of a dog, your brain quickly picks it up that your brain quickly picks up the image of a dog than DOG dog. That's true. So visualization is a critical part of analysis, right? Because after you have analyzed your data, you need to be able to visualize your data in a compelling way to tell a story so that your users can understand what is going on. And then also reporting skills, because you have you, you eventually have to be giving reports. So you so you it's like you went for a research. Analysis is like, oh, I went to do a test. I went to do research. I went to do an experiment, a data experiment, a statistical experiment. These are my findings. These are my recommendations. You need to prepare a report that tells your findings and their recommendations so that your end users can benefit from your findings. Because if you do those um, recommendations, do those findings, and then nobody benefits from it, it doesn't benefit anybody, anything. Okay, so let's proceed. The next essential skill we have is understanding business operations. Yeah. So you cannot fully analyze the data of a business except you understand the business. So you can't just go into a company, an airline company, and say you want to start analyzing data to help them make decisions for a business you don't understand because data is in context. Like I said, it's in context. Uh, Let's see. I'm trying to let me think of an example. I'm trying to think of an example right now. Let's say sales data in a Christmas, sales data in a, in a company that sells Christmas packages and sales data in a, in a regular company that does business all the time, that is not seasonal, that's not affected by seasons. Now, if you're analyzing data of a, Christmas company, you need to understand that these guys, they have been affected by seasons. So sales will definitely increase as Christmas approaches and will definitely reduce as we leave Christmas. And so you cannot come and say that because sales reduced in April compared to December, that the business is not um, doing well as it were because of the context. So you need to understand what's going on. But then if we were in an a Jumia, for example, even a Jumia, for example, yeah. So you can compare sales in a Jumia in um, um, Black Friday, November season to a May or June. So you would observe that the sales in November would be much more higher compared to a May or a June period, period in May or June, significantly because of the November Friday sales, Black Friday sales. So you need to understand how your business runs, understand the, the factors that affect your business so that you can be able to pick the right features to analyze. Because um, as we proceed further, I'll let us know that it's not just about getting data. Part of preparing your data is to decide which features 
to use and which features not to use. So when you understand your business operations and how your business works, you can decide and say, oh, this feature makes more sense in my business. Oh, because my business is a seasonal business, I should look at my sales on a quarterly basis. My business is not a seasonal business. My business runs every day. I have to look at sales on a daily basis. So these are things that you now have to put in the conversion. So that's why it's critically important to understand business operations. And then the final one is communication and storytelling. You need to be able to communicate your findings and tell visual stories from your data. It is one thing to analyze your data. Your data is another thing to tell a compelling story with your data. Yeah. So you need to be able to have that communication skills to pass information across. So you may analyze data and realize that, Ogao, our sales is dropping drastically. And in the next three months, there's a like, there's a 95% because in data, we don't, we, we are, even though we predict, we don't, we are not good. You cannot predict 100% correctly. What we try to do is to reduce the error. So you can see, Ogao, I am 95% sure that this trend will continue in the next three months which means that something is going bad. And so we have to resolve the problem. But then by a stroke of luck, something can just happen and change things. A COVID can happen and change things. So before COVID, for example, Zoom was not selling as much as they are selling at the moment or during, on, or, on, or during the COVID period. But then I'm sure when they were analyzing the data, they, nobody selling about COVID. They were just analyzing the data as, as, this, as the pattern went on, but then, COVID came and just changed things. So those changes could come here and they were going to be able to communicate your findings and then tell management in a compelling manner so they can make decisions out of it. But like I said, at the end of the day, you're not in data for yourself, you're in data for the business. You're in data to help the business make profits. You're in data to help the business see, or like the eyes of the business, to help the business understand what's going on. So you need to be able to tell a story so the business would understand that from my analysis, this and this and this is what I have found out, right? And so we are good to go. All right, so um, the next uh, module we have is career paths in data. Career paths in data. So, all right, so the field of data science analysis is very broad. It's an evolving field. The field is still evolving and it's quite, quite very broad. So, um, like I said, there are several parts in the field of data science and, and analytics, like several career parts. It's a broad field. It's still evolving. In fact, I was in a conference, a, tech, a, a data conference last week, or oh, this week I just finished. Uh, and I saw a new field, a, or a new career path. <sighs> analytics, um, what was it called again? Revenue analytics, yeah. Revenue analytics, Spe specifically for that, right? So like the field is evolving, evolving, and evolving. Okay, career paths in data. There are several parts, like I said. So let's, I'm just going to show us the major four. The core four simplified. The core four. There are more than this, but then this is at the core four. Like every other thing is like inside this one, inside this four. We have the data engineers. We have the analytics engineers. We have the data analysts. And then we have the machine learning engineers. We have data engineers, analytics engineers, data analysts, machine learning engineers and so we'll run through each of them one by one we'll run, we'll run through each of them one by one okay so for data engineers uh let me explain this way so that we can understand data has a source right it's coming from somewhere data is coming from your likes your tweets your your followers and all that. How does Facebook get to those data arranges in a good way? They have someone called data engineers. Data engineers, they move data from outside of your ecosystem into your ecosystem. When I mean ecosystem, I mean your data ecosystem, right? Every organization has a data ecosystem. Now, the guys that help move that data from outside into the system, is data engineers. They have a lot of work in the data cleaning and preparation. Now, because this process can, can be routine, they try to automate this process using programming languages, 
like Python, writing Python scripts and all that because they get data from different sources. If you look at your slide, you see source like files, streams, databases, data comes from databases, data comes from the streams, data comes from different files. These are different sources. How do you get all the data and merge them into one? That's what data engineer does. He uses different tools, several tools, Kafka, Spark, Beam, Dax, several, several tools. And he's able to pre-process this data, clean this data, arrange it, and then load it into a target place. From our image, we have Google BigQuery or Amazon Redshift, which is like a, a, a cloud database structure. So that's what he does. So he basically helps prepare it for the data analyst or the machine learning engineer or the analytics engineer, right? So he's like the front man. People don't get to see him because people don't get to see his work. The people that benefit from his work are the, are we using the data ecosystem? End users don't benefit from his work. So that's why people don't get to see him. But eventually his work is critically important because he's one that ensures data comes in in the right format. The structure is in the right format. Okay. So, um, so we'll move on to the next, the next um, career path, which is analytics engineer. Uh, analytics engineers. Analytics engineer is similar to a data engineer, right? Uh, he transforms data within your ecosystem. So the, the 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 data the data engineer transforms data outside the ecosystem into your system. The analysis engineer does the transformation within your system. Say, for example, the 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 what's it, what's it called? The um, the data engineers have. Um, let me go back to that um, data engineer part. He has he has cleaned the data, put it in Google BigQuery. But then there are some fields that are not in the right format. Now the analytics guy really is all about getting, putting data in a format that the analyst can use to get insight from it. The engineer gets the data from outside, cleans it, stores it in a place. The analysis engineer transforms the data. So it's been a format that the, anal the data analyst can easily analyze the data. So it's, it's, it's like they are doing the same thing, but this one is focused on data already within, the other one is focused on data from the outside. So for big organizations, this is where you have this kind of rules much more functional. Take for example, a Facebook or a Netflix or a Google, they have a data engineer, they have, data, they have a team, not even, they have a team of data engineers, because can you imagine the, 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 the volume of data coming from Facebook daily per second? Per... So they have a, a team of engineers, a team of analysis engineers within as well, who are, who are analyzing, who are, who are putting data in the right format for the analysts to know oh, how many tweets we have today. Who are able to then tell you that, oh, you have tweeted two tweets today. Oh, two of your tweets have been liked by somebody in this location, those kind of a thing. So the analysis engineer transforms data within the ecosystem so it can be in a ready format for the analysts. And then we have the data analyst. He now gets his data and then presents insight analysis to stakeholders. He does dashboards, right? Because the, the, the data engineer does not have any dashboard. He does not care about your dashboard, right? He just wants to get it that clean, prepared, stored in a good way, in a good format for you. The data that comes from outside is always dirty. It's always dirty. Excuse me, please. So he has to clean the data so it can be in the right, prepare it to be in the right format as well so that the analyst can he just he pick it up and analyze data. So he management that, oh, from my analysis on my dashboard, I can see that um, I have more corporate hires this month compared to executive hires, right? That, um, oh, our clients are 77% satisfied. Okay, the analyst, this, this, this is where the analyst comes in, right? He just comes at this point, he does these beautiful dashboards, he tells management. So because the analyst is for the end user, he designs for the end user. Everybody in the organization does not understand data, but they can understand the end use. They can go to a dashboard, select a date, select a field, and then get insights out of it. The analyst prepares that for them. The analysis engineer helps the data analyst. And then the, the data engineer 
like prepares the ground, like the foundation of the house for all of them. Says, I'm making the foundation good for you. Because if it doesn't clean, clean the data very well, the analyst will still get the dirty data. So these are like the core fields in the data science, data analytics space. And then finally, we have the machine learning engineers. Machine learning engineers, they build and move machine learning models to production. So I'm just gonna to try to explain machine learning models as simply as I can. Uh, so machine learning as the name implies means learning from machines ability to learn from data. Um, a normal analysis is that you take your data, analyze your data, see what your data is doing, learn the patterns and describe what's going on. Now, machine learning is, is machine actually doing that thing. So machine learning can take data, learn patterns in that data through mathematical methods, right? And then build models so that if a new set of data comes in, it can make decisions based on that, right? So to just explain that, so on your, on your slide, you can see machine learning models, classification models, regression models, um like last question really means that you have sets of data right okay you have several cats you have several dogs you as a human being you have classified that this is a cat this is a dog this is a cat this is a dog based on several features features like a cat has a long ears compared to a dog dog cat has longer fangs compared to a dog cat has like a long eyes, dogs don't have that kind of eye, all these kind of features, or let's say a cat and a fish. So you can see based on the features of the fish and say this is a fish. So machine learning can learn from features of data and now tell you that, oh, this thing, this feature is given to me is a fish. This features is a dog. That's how your um, YouTube algorithm works, Netflix algorithm. They're all machine learning, they're all machine learning models put into production. So that when you like a video on Netflix, if you go into Netflix for the first time, they tell you, tell us the kind of videos, you, tell us the kind of movies you like, action, drama, romance. And then the machine learning model goes to the database and matches movies that fit those features you have dropped. So machine learning is like you have features and then it matches your features to already made classes and says that based on these features you have given me, romance, uh, action, war, these are the movies that fit it. Take and watch, and you want the movies and enjoy the movies. That's machine learning algorithm at work, right? So deep learning. If you have watched um, this movie Red Notice, you would notice there was there was a the point at that, at that movie when um, I can't remember his name, like the three main actors. When they were going to rob that guy, one of the if you, if you, if you already remember what I'm saying, so they had the they were able to mimic his face to enter into his vault because his face, his, his face was the password to his vault. So they use deep learning to use his image, take the features of his face, and then mimic it to enter into his vault. So really, that's really what machine learning is all about. So these engineers, they create the models, learn from the models, now push the models into production. Now in Netflix right now, in YouTube, nobody's sitting down and writing these programs. The machine learning engineers, they've already pushed these models into production. All they would just do is to routinely check the models over time and see if the models are performing and try to reduce the error rate and even try to optimize the models to perform much more better. That is why YouTube can on its own recommend the video that you would like. Because the machine learning algorithm models are learning from your pattern. They're learning from, they're picking patterns from your features. You watch, you, you watch the football match on YouTube. You watch the backer match today. Tomorrow you watch Chelsea match. Next tomorrow you watch Real Madrid match. Now watch another and that club in Spain, in, in, in Spain's match, they will start giving you Spanish clubs videos on YouTube. So that's really how it works. So that's really what machine learning engineers really kind of do. And then I know we have heard a lot about data scientists and you'll be surprised that I did not say anything about data scientists. This man here says, oh, you're a data scientist. Tell me about, tell me about how you do analysis with Excel. So the thing is, why I did not mention data analytics is because, or, or data scientists, is because the field is evolving and a lot of organizations don't really know what they want, right? 
And so because data scientists is trendy, they just say data scientists. But then that's not really what they want because they don't know what they want. Uh, so data scientist is like a generalist. He does everything, right? He does everything. He's able to do data, he's able to do data engineering work, analytics engineering work, data analytics, machine learning engineers, he's able to do everything. He has a general knowledge. He's, you can just call him a generalist. But then it's important that it, it's important as you're coming to the field that you have a, a goal in mind that okay, I am coming in as a, as a data analyst, but this is where I'm going to. I want to end up as a data engineer. I want to end up as an analyst engineer because you cannot be a data scientist forever. You cannot grow as a data scientist because the field is vague. It's vague. I, I, I don't know if that if that makes sense to us, uh, but then that is that about the field, and that's why I'm not saying about data scientists. So it's just general, it does everything. Everything does so. If you have the understanding of a data engineer's role, data analyst role, you can avail just when you now start adding programming and machine learning algorithms into it, then you're by you're, you're into data scientists. Yeah. Okay. So we go into the interesting part, and the interesting part is what's the shortest learning path to becoming a data analyst? What's the shortest learning path to becoming a data analyst? The shortest learning path to becoming a data analyst. So if all progress, I want to just be sure we are together. So do we have any questions? Anyone have any question before we move on? Any question, anything you'd like to clarify? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, all right. Okay, you made mention of film you know, for you become a data analyst, you also have an idea or knowledge of the business. So does that simply mean, or does that mean, um, if you have a, if you have an idea of the business, you can be a data analyst. So what's the difference between a business analyst and a data analyst? Okay, so I noticed I also did not mention anything around business analyst. I did not mention business intelligence because, like I said, the field is evolving and a lot of names have come out everywhere. But I basically did the same thing. <laughs> I basically did the same thing, really. So a business intelligence officer is a data analyst, right? And so where understanding business operation comes in is that someone who understands business operations may not be a data analyst. Reason is because he does not have the skills of a data analyst. He doesn't know how to clean data. He doesn't know how to analyze data, but he understands the business. But for you to be an effective data analyst, after you have the skills of an analyst, after you can clean data, you can manipulate data, you can write your SQL, you can, man you can play with Power BI, you need, to be able to, you need to be able to understand that particular business you are working for so you can get insights made for that business. That's the relationship. So a data analyst has to understand the business. But someone who understands the business does not have to be a data analyst because he doesn't have the skills for a data analyst. I hope that's clear. I don't know your hand is you. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't know. rather, please, you can ask a question. All right, so... Um, I am an operations person, and I want to understand more about operations analysts. Okay. Okay, so for operation analysts, uh, there's something called operations research. Is it research, operations research, or research operations? Uh, I think it's operations research. That's what it's called. So the idea behind operations research is about optimizing operations using data and analytics. Now, if you notice something, you realize that for each of these, for each of these, um, for each of these people, their tools are somewhat different. The tools and methodology, or not tools rather, the methodology are somewhat different. So for the operations analyst, his focus is to optimize operations. What is the quickest way we can deliver? our goods and services. What is the easiest way we can get this done? His goal is to optimize operations. And so there are several other statistical tools that are particular to operations optimization. So he may not have to focus on learning those tools and analysis to help him optimize operations. So for a machine learning engineer, he's focused on regression, he's focused on clustering, he's focused on on um, classifications, and these are mathematical concepts. For the data engineer, he's focused on 
writing a script that will clean the data properly, take data and load it into somewhere else that will extract the data, transform it and load it. So they are all interrelated, but then they have specific focus, depending on where you're focused on. So for the operations analyst, you will have to now start to research more around operations research. I think that's what the field is called, operations research. And then try to look for mathematical ways to optimize operations, your particular operations, as it fits your own operations needs. I don't know if that answers your question, Adeoli. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay, so let's um, move on. So the shortest learning paths. Men and brethren, the shortest learning paths you can begin on is spreadsheets. Like I said, I started learning with um, machine learning. I was building trees, what I call, if you understand what I'm saying, you understand what I'm saying, like building trees, machine learning trees, random forest trees to learn from data, prediction models and all that. But then it wasn't the best part to take from hindsight. I now realize that it wasn't the best part to take because it's not so much about having the skills you need to be able to be data intelligent. And data intelligence comes from you using data, like play, you making sense out of data. That's where your intelligence comes out from, right? So, and the first and easiest place to get that from is spreadsheets. The first and easiest place to get that from is spreadsheets. So that's why you need to start from spreadsheets because spreadsheets is like the low hanging fruit, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So you, 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 you people will say that me, for example, my, when I said my mentor told me, David, you and do Excel. I was like, no, 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 I don't want Excel. I want to write my Python code. She was like, I'm doing Excel. I said, no. But when I now go to Excel, I realized that, okay, it's beyond writing the codes because on social media, there's so much buzz. There's so much buzz about, um, about, um, about learn Python, about learn SQL, about machine learning. But I tell you, how many companies are using machine learning in Nigeria? A few. If you go to learn machine learning first, you would have the knowledge. You can learn it. Frankly, you can learn it. You have the knowledge. You understand. You can build your trees, make predictions. But then in the real world, when you now try to do a model that will now help a company to predict sales, and you do a model and they lose their companies, uh, the first part is Google Sheets, spreadsheets. Could be Google Sheet, could be Excel. Learn to play with data, manipulate data, understand how data works, enjoy data, enjoy putting it in the sheets. Just play with it, enjoy it. You now start becoming data intelligent. You start becoming, you start to understand how to validate your data. And that's what all the things. You start to, you start to write conditional statements on Excel. If it is this, to give me this. So you start to think logically because you're solving problems with data. So really at the end of the day, Excel is like the easiest way to start off. And so once you're done with spreadsheet, the next thing you to go to is to SQL. Like I said, I didn't start with Python. I didn't start with, with spreadsheets. I didn't start with SQL. I went straight to Python. Now, unbeknownst to me, 90% of organizations today either store their data in spreadsheets or in SQL databases. Yes. So if I would have myself be valuable to an employer, I need to know how to manipulate data in spreadsheets and SQL because the data is stored in SQL. And for me to pick out the data from SQL, I need to understand SQL. SQL means structured query language. It's a language. It's, a simple, it's, like, it's like Excel. It's, 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 if once you can understand Excel, writing functions in Excel, you can do it SQL. It's just a little bit higher. And so once you have mastered spreadsheets, you can play with data spreadsheet. Next thing to go to is into SQL to query databases. And then next one, you're now going to visualization two. Visualization, visualization two could be Power BI, could be Tableau, could be Google Data Studio, could be Click, could be Looker. There are several versions out there, several, plenty of them out there. So it could be any of them. So the whole idea is you need to be, spreadsheet teaches you how to think data intelligence, play with data, understand data. SQL teaches you how to get data from a structured database. And then the visualization tool, which could be Power BI or Tableau Data Studio, now helps you visualize your data for your end users to see. And then the next important part is projects. Attempt projects. Attempt projects. Attempt more projects. 
This cannot be overemphasized because you actually learn by doing. You learn by doing. You learn by doing. You don't learn by just learning. You don't. You don't go through this tutorial. You can do lots of tutorials and tutorials and tutorials and tutorials, and tutorials but then the learning actually comes from doing, right? Doing real projects. Okay. And then the final model, I think the final model is um, the phases in the data analytics process. What are the phases in the data analytics process? There's something called Crips DM, cross standard, no, cross industry standard. Oh my God, I can't remember it properly. What is the standard for data mining? Cross industry standard method for data mining, something like that. We'll figure it out. And so this is how this is what it looks like. It starts from you understanding the business. You have your data, understand the business, understand your data, prepare your data, model your data, evaluate your data, and then deploy your data. And then deploy your data. So you <coughs> Understand your business, understand your data, prepare your data, model your data, evaluate it, deploy. If once you have evaluated and evaluation is not right, you go back to understanding your business again. So perhaps it could be, it could be from your business understanding. So if you're building the machine learning model, you need to be able to understand the business. And then you cannot recommend that, oh, for this need, this is the kind of data we'll need. We'll need such and such and such data for this information. So this is like the cross-industry standard for any data analysis process. In other words, when you start analyzing data, you don't go into uh, what's the name? You don't start. You don't just go into um, model modeling, building visuals. You need to understand the business properly, understand the data properly, prepare it, clean it, take away the noises, prepare the data, model it, evaluate it, and then deploy it. So if we go back to those, our different career paths in data, you will see that everybody falls in here. The analyst understands the business. The engineer understands the business. The analytics engineer also understands the business. And then because he understands the data, he prepares the data. The analytics guy model it. The data analyst finally evaluates it or deploys it on a dashboard or a machine learning production as the case may be. So this is really like the, the whole idea around data analysis, like cross-industry standard for data mining. This is the standard, like all your process should take this format. You don't just jump into deployment or model building. You have to understand, prepare, model, evaluate. If it's not good enough, you go back the cycle again. Yeah. Okay, so let's go into our um, demonstration. So I said we using a cargo data sets. Spots earning sports atlas okay highest atlas earning highest atlas huh? atlets earnings 1990 okay yes forbes high paid atlas forbes high paid atlas 1992 2021 so the data set just has four columns, a very simple data set. Has the name, earnings, year, and sports of the highest paid sportsmen from 1990 to 2021. So we'll just play with them, Google Data Studio with this and just see how can just visualize data and just play with it briefly. Uh, so I'll go to Google Data Studio. So Google Data Studio is free. Once you have a Google account, you can log into it and play with several data sets in it. Yeah. Have fun with it. So, oh, I've not, I've not done the downloaded data set. So let me download the data sets. Okay, why is there a zip file? So I'm just going to call it Forbes, Forbes test CSV. So I've saved the file. So I'll go to, um, I'm going to go back to 
Google Data Studio and import the file. So I'm not trying to teach. I'm just trying to just show us a little demo. Uh, so I'm just going to be rushing through it. Oops. Where's the file? I named the file. Oops, now. Ops test. Okay. So I've imported the file in Data Studio. So add. All right, so Data Studio is almost like, so the idea is if you're able to get one of these visualizations tools, you can almost work with every other visualization tools because like the function the same way, right? The function the same way. So um, let's see. Let's say we want to see the, let's, let's plot the line chart that shows the earnings of, that shows the earnings uh, from 1990 to date, how the earnings has been from 1990 to date. So I'm going to insert a line chart, a time series chart. So a line chart, a time series chart, it shows the, the trend of events over time, right? So, um, uh, Okay, I do not want this. I want earnings as my metric and dimension is here. So you can just expand this. And we can see the trend. We can see that the highest, um, so I'm not gonna beautify it because I just didn't like just a demo. We can see that the highest, so just visualizing this, this data tells us that it shows us the highest and the lowest points from 1990 to date. That the highest earnings, like all the all these all the highest paid athletes, all of them joined together, like the highest paid in 2019. That's about three billion, right? And then the lowest was in 2001. What happened in 2001? I don't know, but then that's what the data is telling us. So this um, information here is correct. This data is is um, cool. Is correct. It says tracks the highest paid athletes in the world for each year, except okay. So you see, it says except 2001 when they switched the time period for which data was tallied. So do we see? So I was wondering why there was why it was zero for 2001. So we just went back to understand the business, and we saw that in quote the business in quote, and we see that oh. There was nothing going on at that period, at that point in time. Does that make sense? Yes. Sir. Okay, so let's 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 um, add some more things to it. Let's say we can see the trends by year. Let's see. Look, let's do um. Let's do. Let's get the highest spots. The top five or the top ten spots, highest paid spots type. Now remember that sports type is not a numerical variable, a numerical data. So I cannot use line charts. It's a categorical data. That's I'm using a, a bar chart. So I'm going to put sports type in dimension. And then it tells me that all time, for all time, like for all time, uh, basketball, has the highest like basketball players and more for all time compared to football cricket are like the least paid so that little things we can see okay uh what else we can we can we can add things to it let's say I want to add the the um let's 
Let's let's do it. Let's add the name here. Let's add the name here and see what comes up. Mm -hmm. Or the year. doesn't work. Okay, oh no, no, this is too dirty. This is too dirty, this is too dirty. Okay, let's do something instead. Let's add a filter. Let's add a year filter on this. Let's add a year filter on this. Uh, let's put the filter here. And let's, let's here be our filter. So we we'll see the we see the, let's bring it up here, like to visualize it on the report page itself. Pull up, just pull up. So let's filter by here. So I'm just doing it through, like I'm not, I'm not doing a finished project. I just want to just see what things we can do. So let's say here, yeah, 2000. In 2000, basketball is still the all time highest. What year was they woke up? Woke up was in 20, was it, what year was they woke up? Let's, let's see the woke up here. 2010, 2014, 2018. 2010, let's see if football will come up then. 2010 is still, still not there. Basketball is still higher than football in 2010. Let's see 2018. Wow. So it tells us that basketball players are actually higher speed, like they earn more than, than, than these guys. Okay, so let's let's um, let's go back to our editor. Let's add. Um, let's instead make this sports in their names. Let's see their names instead. Okay, so it's just telling me now that the highest earnings of all time is Floyd Mayweather, or in twenty eighteen. Is that true? Let's remove the filter and see without the filter. Okay, so the highest earnings of all time is Tiger Woods. Hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Let's Google and see. Highest Forbes, highest. It was the highest paying athlete for a very long period of time. Oh, wow, wow, all time. This 2017. Okay, this 2021. So that was all time. So if 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 what you say is true, then um, okay. So I have. Uh, and the, if you look at it, he also lost like half of his um networks to so divorce. Okay, 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 okay. So let us see if we can get more meaning or more sense out of this. Let's see if we add, uh, okay. Let's make our filter to be sports instead. Let's filter by sports instead. Football. Mm. My data not entered properly. Is there somebody called Tom, Tom Brandy as a footballer? No idea. This is American football, I think. Okay, this is American soccer. football. Let's see Tom Brady. Search soccer. Okay, it's American football, true. Let's, let's see soccer. Oh, so we have Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi all time, like all time. Cristiano Ronaldo tops Messi. So let's see um, basketball. Oh, then? Oh, Ronaldo. Oh, Ronaldo. Ha, ha, ha. LeBron James <laughs> stops Michael Jordan. So there are lots of things you can do with this. Like you can play around with it. You can check for, you can, you can decide to see their earnings per sport per year. So lots of things you can do, really. Lots of things you can do. So these are just to give us a sneak peek of 
So you know you can't give you can't put this on a dashboard like this. You need to clean it up. You need to make it more aesthetic. You need to make it more visually appealing, sort of a thing. Yeah. So um, that's really what it is. So I, I hope um we got a few things out of this.